Welcome to this online panel discussion with v Dundee in collaboration with Scotland and Venice Partnership and the British Council. My name is Nicole Keane and I'm the creative programmer here at v Dundee and I have worked on this series of events with our brilliant partners. Please do pop a hello in the chat box saying who you are and where you're tuning in from. It's always really nice to know who is out there. Um, I hope many of you have been able to go and see What If Scotland at VNA Dundee. If not, it's showing until the 21st of November, so please do come or come back. Before I get into the detail of tonight's event, I wanted to draw your attention to some of the practical functions we're going to use on Zoom. This, evening talk, this evening's talk is being BSL interpreted by Bruce and Heather. You can spotlight Bruce and Heather using the video, using the three dots on the top right corner of their video boxes and selecting pin video. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk using the Q&A function. We're going to address all of those at the end. Um, if you would like to use the closed caption function, please enable that on your bottom bar. Details on how to use all of these functions have been posted in the chat. And if you're going to talk about this event online, which we definitely do encourage, please do tag us at VA Dundee and at Scotland Venice and using any of the speakers links which are going to be posted during the event. Tonight, we are joined by a really wonderful panel. How, we, how will we live together was the question posed by the 17th International Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale. Drawing on the creative minds across the world, the projects presented have been wildly different. The urgency of the question has sparked ideas and made connections in unexpected and compelling ways. Tonight, we are joined by some of the international curators and creators of the projects that responded to this provocation. From Britain to Lithuania to Ireland to Kenya and back to Scotland. To kick off, each project's representatives will be giving a five minute overview of their projects. And this is going to be followed by a discussion and an audience Q&A that's going to be chaired by Tamsi Thompson. Tamsi has been the CEO of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland since July 2021. Before this, she was the Managing Director of New Architecture London, uh, New London Architecture even, and the Director of the London Festival of Architecture for five years. Before that, she was the Director of London, of Director of London for REBA. And before that, she ran Building Futures, a future think tank for the built environment. Before we are joined by Tamsi, I wanted to invite Jim McDonald, the Chief Executive of Architecture Design Scotland on to say a few words um, about the Scotland and Venice partnership. Jim, if you wanna join us. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, good evening, everybody. Yes, um, I'm Chief Executive of Architecture and Design Scotland, but tonight I'm here on behalf of the Scotland and Venice Partners, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second of our public events as part of the What If Scotland exhibition. Um, for those of you who don't know, the partners are made up of Creative Scotland, the British Council, National Galleries of Scotland, the Scottish Government, and ourselves at ANDS. And the partnership asks, acts as a main funder and commissioning body, appointing a different curatorial partner or project for each biennale across art and architecture and working with the artists and architectural practices in the process. Um, Scotland Venice is a major international initiative and it's designed to promote the best of Scotland in terms of contemporary arch and architecture on the world stage. It was founded in 2003 and we support the development of new work and foster international connections and exchange. The aim is to position Scotland internationally as a distinctive, dynamic and diverse centre for creative excellence, fostering ambitious, innovative work in the fields of contemporary art and architecture, alongside professional dialogue, public engagement and cultural exchange, including, importantly, opportunities for students in the arts and architecture. While Venice means a world stage for Scotland, it also provides us with a springboard to promote and celebrate the contribution of art and architecture at home through a parallel programme of exhibitions, resources and events like tonight's. It's fair to say this year has been a bit different and what was planned as an exhibition in our new venue in Venice in 2020 has instead, and somewhat magically, become an exhibition at the v &A in Dundee. Uh, the success and the level of engagement, though, has this has achieved is inspiring, and it's certainly something that we are keen to repeat in the future, and lessons are certainly being learned about how to do that. 
Happily, Scotland and Venice is planning a return to Venice itself in 2022 with a presentation of work by the artist Alberta Whittle, and we are all very much looking forward to that and to future architecture and art exhibitions in the years that follow. So on behalf of all the partners, thanks again for being with us tonight. I'm sure it's going to be a great evening. And I will now hand on to Tamsi, who is our chair for the rest of the evening. Hi, good evening and welcome. Um, I'm going to start with a, an apology that I've been having some uh, difficulties with my internet connection. So if it's a little stuttery, um, apologies, and uh, we'll keep going and, and do our best. Hopefully it'll, it'll bear up. Um, I thought it would be really useful to start this evening by setting the context for tonight's conversation um, and discussion. Um, for those who don't know or who haven't been to Venice, the speakers that we're going to hear tonight have all participated in the 2021 edition. The architecture uh, biennale happens every two years. It lasts approximately six months and around 110, 112 countries bring their brightest and their best architects to create exhibitions and installations that respond to a theme. For 2021, as Nicole said, the theme is, how will we live together? Which I think in light of the pandemic um, and all sorts of other global events um, seems more pertinent than ever. The Biennale happens in historic pavilions in the Giordani, Giordani excuse my Italian, um, you have to imagine it like a park with pavilions of different ages and different architectural styles, each one belonging to an individual country. It also happens in the Arsenale, which is a large um, historic arsenal building uh, for Venice, much more like a complex than, than an individual building. And it also happens in all the palazzos and squares um, around the historic city. So each of those pavilions and within that Arsenale um, building, there are contributions from individual countries. And I think there are about 60 countries that participate in that way, um, including, I think, three new for this year, including Iraq and Uzbekistan. Alongside those contributions from individual countries, there is the international exhibition, uh, which each year has its own cur curator. Um, and that sits within this uh, arsenal complex and within a central pavilion in the gardens. And then alongside that, we have all their collateral events and they happen in the city uh, and everywhere else. And that's where we see Scotland's What If at the VNA sitting in this year. Um, and I, I hope one of many, I think one of the challenges that all VNLs have is that they happen in a space and a time. And what's really exciting is the opportunity to bring some of that out to Venice and to a wider public audience. Um, the Biennale generally is an opportunity to learn and to share and to gain insights into the architectures of countries you may never have visited and to see and to understand yourself um, and perhaps your country, your own practice and your own understanding of the world um, in that international context. So today we're going to hear from five participants who represented their countries in different ways um, at this year's Biennale. Um, we're going to hear from Ireland, Scotland, Kenya, Great Britain and Lithuania. Now, each of these teams responded to their current themes and the discourse within their country of origin. And then they've set that on the international stage under that theme that we heard before, how will we live together? So our speakers in um, no particular order that we're going to hear from uh, are Ewan Anderson uh, from Edinburgh-based Practice 7N. Ewan's project, What If, seeks to re-engage the civic role of design professionals within communities. We're going to hear from Madeline and Manager from Unseen Architecture with their garden of privatised delights, inspired by one of my famous favourite paintings, the famous Hermes Bosch, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And theirs is a call for thinking on the, how we rethink those um, privately owned spaces going forward. Representing um, Kenya, we have Cabage and Stella um, from Architecture Practice Cave Bureau. And they've chosen to recreate a space that was used by freedom fighters uh, in the 20th century. And they've done that to create a space to offer discussion on architecture um, within the African context. Um, we're going to hear from Claire and Fiona, whose project Entanglement, uh, representing Ireland, 
explains the materiality of data and its impact on spatial forms. Um, and last, definitely not least, we're going to hear from Julianis um, from the brilliantly named uh, Lithuanian Space Agency project. And this is a project which proposes actually making planets out of people, um, which I think is obviously fascinating. Um, so we're going to start um, by handing over to Claire and Fiona um, to hear about their projects. Claire and Fiona, over to you. Okay, can everybody see that? Are we good? Yeah, great, excellent. Okay, so um, I'm just going to introduce the context for the um, Irish Pavilion at the Biennale, which is called Entanglement. And it explores the materiality of the cloud with a particular focus on how data production and consumption territorializes the physical landscape of Ireland. As our lives become increasingly entangled with data technologies, the project questions the environmental and social consequences, while also asking how might we reconsider our future environments as we live together with data. So the project is curated by an interdisciplinary group called Annex. Um, it's made up of architects, artists, and researchers, and its members are Sven Anderson, Alan Butler, David Kappener, Don Lally, uh, Claire, who's here, and myself. So today, Ireland is home to the corporate headquarters of the major technology companies, while also hosting the backstage infrastructural operations. This recent and rapid intensification of global data now manifests itself locally as a constellation of data storage sheds, fiber optic networks, and energy infrastructures. From vast data centers, such as those of Facebook and Amazon, as shown here in aerial photographs, which collectively form an expanded network of data facilities that proliferate the verges of our cities, as seen here in a map of Dublin, to the way by which the global data infrastructure becomes embedded in our rural and coastal landscapes, as shown here in Kalala Bay, County Mayo, in the far west of Ireland, where the new ACE1 transatlantic cable comes to land, and with sites locally poised for further data center development and associated energy generation. But beyond the development of these back-end infrastructures, there is yet another layer of data infrastructure extending across unlikely facets of the Irish environment. From optimizing dairy farms to instrumenting bogs and data specific data and forest specific data analytics, an exponential amount of data uh, is being used and, and implemented um, throughout our natural and built environments. So one of the most direct and pressing consequences of this data infrastructure uh, development is that of energy use. And here you can see a headline uh, from uh, the Irish Times uh, last month where uh, some academics believe that where all the data centers proposed to be connected, um, uh, that it, it would take up to 70% of the national grid capacity by 2030. But Ireland's role as a strategic node for global te uh, technology infrastructure is nothing new. Owing to its favourable location on the western edge of Europe, it has historically played a disproportionately significant role in network communications. Here we see a photo from 1856, when uh, the first transatlantic telecommunication was pulled ashore at Valencia Island off the southwest coast. The 3,000 cable 3,000 kilometre cable that extended from Newfoundland um, to rendered Ireland the most connected node in a global network. And then almost 50 years later, you have Marconi, who sets up a communication station in the Connemara Bog in County Galway to transmit some of the first uh, commercial wireless networks across the transatlantic. So you can see the building blocks of the internet, wireless networks, and our contemporary planetary communication networks begin here in Ireland. And now Claire is going to talk a little bit about the pavilion itself. Thanks, Fiona. I just want to talk for a few minutes about the pavilion as a medium in and of itself, in terms of how it communicates um, some of the uh, things that Fiona just talked about. So the pavilion, putting it simply, is a tower. It's about six meters high and about maybe um, 25 feet in diameter, uh, made of three tiers of server racks, the server rack being the kind of primary component of the data center. And embedded into that structure are different components from screens um, to fans, to cables, to plants. And these work together 
um, toward a narrative that reveals to the audience the conceit of the cloud. That is that the cloud is not an ethereal and magic space, uh, but is something that has very direct um, material implications. And the pavilion, these components work together in a performance that lasts 20 minutes in the Arsenale um, that mimics the four stages of fire, which is um, ignition, growth, inferno, and decay. And so this notion of fire and heat is actually a very important reference in the pavilion. You'll see some images here that these server racks that I'm talking about have been artificially torched or singed. Um, and that's because um, at some point in our research, we kind of latched on to the argument that um, the production and dissemination of information is inextricably tied to the production and dissemination of heat or fire. And so, for example, even in the 19th century, very high temperatures were needed to process copper in earlier industrial era cables to more contemporary settings where you have these Bitcoin mines that are the servers are so hot in the facilities that the actual building self combusts. Um, and then from a more social um, aspect, we were interested in the fire as the kind of primitive space where information exchange historically took place. So fire typologies became a very important reference in the pavilion to the point that some of us even go so far as to say the tower is, is a bonfire. And then just looking at some of the components, um, fans, screens, cables, as I said, um, in addition, we have some plants in the pavilion, which reference um, a species called the gutta percha tree, which was native to Indonesia um, and was farmed um, as a kind of colonial material, um, as an insulating uh, material for the early industrial era cables. So that the latex from the, the tree um, was a brilliant insulator underwater and could keep the transmission in the copper cables um, um, very um, alive. Um, uh, in addition, on those screens that I mentioned, we have these thermographic images. Thermographic cameras were put onto drones um, and sent out over that Dublin landscape that Fiona showed on the map. And of course, the thermographic camera is interesting because it, it, its primary register is heat. Um, and so it's, it, it's able to render legible um, aspects of data infrastructure that is illegible to the kind of human eye. Um, there's seats around the, the bonfire in the pavilion that are made from slate from a quarry on Valencia Island, which again was the place where the original cable came ashore. Um, and these slate seats are etched with historic cable trajectories with cross sections of original cables that are embedded fossil-like into the surface of the slate. Um, uh, so just in terms of today's discussion, um, you know, what if we live differently, um, given the context of how pertinent data infrastructure is in our lives? Two issues afoot in Ireland at the moment that kind of prove source um, for some speculation. The first is that, um, uh, the heat exhaust from the data center is now being used um, to heat homes and public buildings in a suburb around an Amazon data center in Dublin. So that's productive. Um, the second thing is that many of the large corporations are now entering into arrangements with energy companies to develop renewable energy sites, mostly in the west coast of Ireland, where we have a lot of wind energy and um, a lot of free land. And so those two facets um, sort of prompt some speculations for all of us in Annex moving forward in terms of how we could recombine or resynthesize energy, data, work, office, um, and living scenarios into new hybrid environments. Um, this is just a proposal for a farm that plays on the different sort of storage aspects from data um, to a kind of corporate HQ that might exist in a more rural environment. Um, and these uh, projects and more 
um, form a part of a book that we've just published in tandem with the pavilion that starts to um, illustrate other speculations for how we might live together with data infrastructure, not just in Ireland, but globally moving forward. So um, thank you for that opportunity. And now I think we're going to pass on to uh, Kabagi and Stella. Fantastic. So we hope to present uh, the project we exhibited uh, at the Giardini in Venice called Obsidian Rain uh, for this title talk, What If? And the curated title was, How Will We Live Together? And I'll be presenting it with Stella Mutegi, uh, a co-founder, co-director of Cave Bureau, Cave Bureau. So we are a Nairobi-based bureau of architects and researchers charting explorations into architecture and urbanism within nature. Our work addresses the anthropological and geological context of the post-colonial African city as a means to confront the challenges of our contemporary and rural lives. Um, and this is a photo of those people doing that that Kabage has um, introduced. We're a very small farm um, and we double up as um, traditional architects. So you know, what your traditional architect does but we also um, do quite a bit of research and it's the research beat that has, um, that took us to the Biennale and to other places um, that we've been fortunate to, um, to exhibit and publish um, on. Um, in the next slide is a slide of Kabage and I in one of the um, expeditions we do while we carry out our research. So, you know, there are times we sit in our office drafting and talking to contractors and um, yelling at engineers and all that. Um, but then we get away from that and get to explore. Most of the time we are exploring caves. So this was um, for the Anthropocene 4.0, which is uh, no 3.0, which um, was caves that we looked at in Shimoni. Uh, Shimoni is off the east coast of, um, of Kenya. I'll introduce the project, the Anthropocene Museum. And it's not so much as a building, but as a reflection and a critical view on the age we're in right now, at least the proposed geological age, which is the Anthropocene, uh, uncomfortably called the age of man, which has been criticized uh, by many thinkers and artists, architects. And I think from an African perspective, we felt it important to look at what this age means for us, not only as human beings, but nature at large within this beautiful blue planet. And it's critically um, pressing, more so in terms of our impact on the climate, our environment, the nature of pollution that we emit, not only in the air, but the seas, and uh, you name it, through the entire globe, and it's no longer a question of, of if our impact has had that effect, but to what extent. And there are numerous scientific models that have shown the increased greenhouse gas emissions have been as a result of man-made impact on the world. This to the extent that we are effectively going to be positioned within the international chronostographic chart. Uh, the end of the Holocene that will take place and effectively into the Anthropocene. It is still a proposed age. There's ratification left, but if it goes through, we will find ourselves as within the geological timescale. But with that said, it's easy to forget that how this came about was through a strong and uh, unfortunate history of exploitation, subjugation of peoples of the global south, which resulted in where we are today. And we look at that critically um, when you look at the Anthropocene. And for us, at least, we look at the great acceleration, which is proposed beginning of the Anthropocene, i.e. the 1950s, 
at the very point when most, uh, uh, very many, should I say, Global South countries were fighting against colonization. And we, for example, in Kenya, used caves to stage our protests, to stage our battles and guerrilla warfare against the British government. And so there were these twin pronged approaches to look at the Anthropocene as a very point when there was a huge spike uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, um, pollution, and at that very much, very much time, should I say, we were resisting those pressures and those impacts on, onto the world. So we work and look at the works of artists, this uh, Osborne Masharia, at the freedom fighters. The freedom fighters were not just men, but women and children who staged uh, huge complex uh, military um, practices within the landscape, hiding in forests, and as I said, hiding within caves. And the art world, should I say, is beginning to open up to, to that history from an African perspective. And this was just one piece which we, we quite like and enjoy. The, if you look deeply into the caves, which is as what Stella said, we, we do focus in, on caves. And this is one cave in, on the outskirts of Nairobi called the Mbai Cave, a cave that was used by the freedom fighters and one that we surveyed using laser technology and a cave in effect that we transposed from Kenya to Venice using stones. And this picture quite simply depicts uh, the laser technology output, if you'd call it, where we take that laser scan, we create architectural drawings from that one-to-one -one scale uh, information. We begin to represent the cave as it is and think about it in, in time and, and sort of the past, the history of these spaces that were spaces of Congress where our ancestors would meet and contemplate the African state of the future while really trying to imagine what the resistance to fight for that freedom would look like. And so we, we use these drawings as, as artifacts and information of deep time that can transcend our thought about the history and look into, into the present and future in effect in, in a new light. And so the museum is, is sort of cut in cross sections. It's transposed over geology um, where we live in Kenya, it's highly geological in, in many respects. There are three vol volcanoes uh, dormant uh, within a radius of no more than 200 kilometers. And these caves are lava tube caves, which we then cut through and go through sections as, as represented. And from that, we generate uh, 3D uh, bronze cast models to represent them in different scales. And the dots highlighted show different positions where the Mau Mau freedom fighters would inhabit the caves and stage their protests, where they would sleep, where they would light fires. And these again, going back to the sort of history of Benin and the bronze heads and being able to use that, that skill set over time to then create these artifacts to represent that history. And these are just simple sketches that were first submitted to the curator, Hashim Sarkis, who, who seemed to take an interest in, in the sort of geological approach. So we went through many stages of choosing the stones that we'd use and sort of very quickly homed in onto obsidian, uh, which is very much in abundance in the Rift Valley, uh, a product of lava cooling really fast. And our idea was to move 1,600 stones and hang them in the Giardini Galileo Chini Dome as depicted here. And the idea going back to our continued research, which we do in the Anthropocene Museum, staging conversations within caves. So we took a piece of the cave 
into Venice as a space where we would have meetings and, and, and contemplate the challenges, at least within the Biennale space, but unfortunately sort of ca um, curtailed by the pandemic. Um, and um, how we transposed it is we were given the space in the Galileo Chini dome. And um, it's an octagonal shape, um, the geometry of it. And we used the space to try and recreate what, um, what that cave, um, the Mbai caves would be in that space. And what we did was um, identify a ledge above the columns that we then used as our support for, for the, the hanging stones and distributed the load um, on timber columns, what you see in the red. And from that, then we hang a tensile uh, steel uh, mesh, which then transferred that load down to each column. So the total, um, the total weight of this whole um, installation was about 1.5 tons, 1,500 kilograms. And from that, we had that weight uh, transferred to each column. So each column was taking about 160, 165 um, kilos um, per column. And the columns were wood that we used. Um, it was uh, recycled blue laminated wood, which we got from a forest in Finland. So that's where we sourced that from. And of course, we are architects, and this was a highly technical um, uh, installation. So we were very fortunate to be able to work with um, Erko Domas, who are Italian um, structure engineers, who worked out the whole installation, how big the columns needed to be, what spacing the mesh needed to be, how many stones. Uh, hanging what weight each stone would be. So that was something we collaborated quite well. This was some of the schematic drawings we were doing and diagrams to sort of see how it would all uh, fit together, how initially we had planned to have conversations um, sitting under the, the, the cave, so to speak. But unfortunately, um, COVID happened and social distancing is a big thing now. So that was something that um, uh, didn't happen. Naskabage mentioned these stones were from an area called Gilgil. Gilgil is a town about 130 kilometers uh, from Nairobi. And we transported those stones. Um, initially, we had 1,800 stones. But in the final installation, as Kabage has mentioned, we installed 1,600 um, stones. So we got the stones transported to Nairobi, then we had to drill holes um, into them. Um, and then into that hole, put a piece of uh, timber so that we could um, get a hook, um, put a hook in there so that we could then hang, hang the stones from the mesh. We used um, steel wire um, because we also wanted it to sort of, initially we had wanted to use sisal um, but of course, it was a fire hazard. So we ended up um, uh, using the steel wire. And then the steel wire actually worked much better because it sort of disappears. It was a very, it's a very thin um, wire. It sort of disappears um, in the dome. So when you stand underneath this um, dome, it almost looks invisible. It's almost like... Um, as we call it, the obsidian rain, a rain of stones falling. So these are some of the drawings that we shared with um, the, the Biennale organizers and the engineers. It was very a very rigorous exercise because we had um, to tell the engineer how many stones we have on each row. So we had about 37 um, rows of stone. And on each row, you had to tell the engineer, hang this stone, it weighs this much, so that he could then um, think how he's going to distribute all that weight back to the, to the columns. Um, installation was 
a hard, hard, hard um, <laughs> task. Uh, we were meant to be five of us from the office doing that installation. And out of the five, only one person made it, which was Kabage. And it's quite interesting that yesterday here in Nairobi, uh, in Kenya, we were celebrating a public holiday, which we call Mashuja Day. Mashuja Day um, is Swahili, which just translates to Heroes Day. So Kabage was our Mashuja, our hero for that day, for, because he did the whole um, <laughs> installation by himself, 1,000. 600 stones, but um, he was quite fortunate to have the Biennale um, people and the, and the engineers help him out there. So as part of the, of the, um, of the exhibition was, um, of the installation was this bronze cast models that Kabage um, spoke about. And it just shows like, for instance, it's an exact replica of what the cave is. Yes, so just some images as I wrap up um, of what, what the installation was. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And this, yes, from underneath, if you looked at it, it just it really did look like rain because you don't really perceive the steel wire that's hanging, that's hanging the stones. And to conclude, I think the um, the fresco, which is an Art Nouveau uh, piece um, on the turn of the 19th century, um, was a nice contrast to, to this work and this history. And from an African perspective, we felt. And in a way, the juxtaposition worked quite well and uh, as a way to look into the past, but yet the present and the future. Thank you. Now we're going to invite Madeline Kessler and Manny Jevergis to tell us more about the Garden of Privatized Delights. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having us and um, absolutely fascinating presentations. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here today, I'm Madeline Kessler and I'm here today with my co-curator, Manager Verghese. Um, and we're gonna present our uh, project for the British Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale, which is the Garden of Privatised Delights. Um, and the Garden of Privatised Delights explores privatised public space across the UK. Um, and so our exhibition takes inspiration from this painting by Hieronymus Bosch called The Garden of Earthly Delights. And it uses the format of a triptych uh, to show the utopia of Garden of Eden on the left, uh, the dystopia of hell on the right. And this frames this middle ground of earth, which becomes the subject of the painting. And we sort of took this painting and reinterpreted it um, as our, our painting, The Garden of Privatised Delights. Uh, which translates the three panels into the utopia of the commons before the Enclosures Act of the 18th century on the left, the dystopia of total privatisation on the right, and then this middle ground, uh, which sort of explores privatised public space, which is this world that we're all living in today. Um, and this painting as a tool sort of allows us to delve into that um, and essentially challenge this po polarisation of public and private uh, to rethink how we can create more inclusive and accessible public spaces. Um, and so approaching the pavilion um, in Venice, you're sort of greeted by this planting, which sets up your journey into the Garden of Delight. And you're essentially entering into that middle ground um, of the painting. And so each of the six rooms of the British Pavilion has been transformed into an immersive installation, which sort of provides this testing ground for how we can rethink and better open up our public spaces. Um, and then there's also sort of the surprise seventh annexed room, um, which is the toilets, um, which we'll also uh, talk more about um, later. And so on entering the pavilion, you sort of find yourself outside the railings of the Garden of Delights. Um, and this is really setting up this overarching issue with privatised public space that is often not accessible to everyone. Um, and so you can see there's something going on behind, but you're sort of immediately um, sort of ushered on um, into the next room. And you have to continue your journey through the entire pavilion until you find yourself back inside the Garden of Delights. 
And so you, you're ushered on and you find yourself in Publicani, which is uh, the pub, and this is designed by a collective called The Decorators. Um, and it's really looking at how the pub can be more than a, a place just for drinking and become a versatile centre for civic action. And so you see these familiar elements of the pub, such as the carpets, those are two pub carpets from Weatherspoons. Every single Weatherspoons has a different carpet. Um, and these other kind of elements um, of pubs within the room. And then the bar structure has been transformed um, into this element which has lots of different heights and therefore allows everyone to come around the table together and it's got pieces of infrastructure embedded in it uh, such as a letterbox um, and plug sockets which allow it to really become this communal uh, kind of central piece. So from there you enter into um, the Ministry of Collective Data and in addition to existing kind of um, space uh, privatised public spaces that you would find in cities across the UK um, we also proposed two new government ministries in the pavilion. So this one, the Ministry of Collective Data, was designed by Builtworks, who are an art and architecture practice. And when you enter, there's this screen right at the front that tells you um, if you consent to your data being captured, you have to walk right. And if you don't, then you walk left and you proceed as a kind of undocumented shadow. But if you walk right, your data gets captured and then um, you get translated into an avatar. And as you move around the room, it kind of follows you but there's these large tree trunks that you can hide behind if you want to camouflage yourself and conceal yourself from the cameras. But then the central totem tells you more information about what would happen if this data was collectively owned and we could actually decide how it would be used. So in this room, we were really interested in exploring you know, how technology isn't necessarily born bad, but maybe what's bad about it is that it's not always clear who owns that data and how it's going to be used. So how can we kind of give the individual or the collective more agency in terms of determining how their data would be used. And then from there, we move on to the high street. And this was designed by um, a social enterprise practice called Studio Polpo, who are based in Sheffield. And um, here, the, the room is really trying to look at different forms of exchange. So it's called the high street of exchanges. And um, it's just looking at how um, high streets are changing. And actually it's a space that's kind of often under threat in that um, high streets up and down the country have shops that are closing and how we need to really reinvent these spaces um, as we move forward into the future. So it's looking at spaces like the hairdresser where when you pay for a haircut, you're not just paying to have your haircut, but actually you're paying for the conversation that you might have. Or um, in the middle space uh, where the stools are, you're actually, um, that's modeled on a pay as you feel space in Sheffield called Food Hall where you know, you're, you're allowed to come in and actually, instead of just you know, paying for a cup of coffee, you're actually getting a space to work, but also you might be able to exchange skills and knowledge with other people that you find there. And then in the last section, they're really looking at um, kind of spaces of exchange. So when you enter the room, what you can't see is there's an ATM that dispenses um, advice instead of cash. And then um, at the in that last section, there's a receipt printer where you can take away, you can print off and take away some of that advice to reflect on and maybe apply um, to your own kind of spaces and cities when you return to them. So um, then we move into the second ministry, the Ministry of Common Land. And this was designed by a practice called Public Works. And they this mound-like shape in the middle of the room is a citizens assembly. And it's really looking at a more bottom-up approach to decisions around land. And um, rather than the hierarchy of a traditional minister's office where the minister sits behind the desk, um, the architecture kind of lends itself to people kind of going or sitting around one table and taking decisions around land because the issue currently in the UK is that what is supposedly public land is often being sold off to private investors and often foreign investors without the public's knowledge. And so how can the average citizen have more of a say in um, how that land is being used and who actually owns it? And you can see these paper mache heads on the top. They were actually made by school children in Stratford. Um, which is in East London, and they kind of represent some of the key figures in the discussion around common land, like Jane Jacobs and Colin Ward. So um, you then go to uh, the uh, Play Without Grounds, which is designed by VPPR, and this room is really looking at spaces for teenagers in the city and how there's nowhere for them to go, and they often find um, themselves shut out of, or viewed with a great deal of suspicion, and so you know, we, um, this, in this room, the practice was really looking at how teenagers find themselves kind of too old for the playground, but too young for the pub. And so in, in the absence of a space for them, rather than designing on their behalf, there's actually a series of interviews with teenagers from different backgrounds to actually understand 
kind of what kinds of spaces would they like to occupy and what are the barriers that are preventing them from accessing the city. So there's space for you to dance at the center, to climb up, to relax at the top. And um, there's a lot of research that says there's lots of space in the city for active teenagers, but not a lot of hangout space where teenagers who feel less inclined to skateboard or play basketball can actually just sit and spend time with each other. Um, and then finally, having been through the whole pavilion, you find yourself back in the Garden of Delights, but this time on the inside of the railings. And here, this kind of abstract structure at the center, which is this tree-like form, is divided into five sections where you can cook, you can grow produce, you can play, you can sit and have a conversation, or what we thought was even more important was sometimes just to sit by yourself and have a quiet moment to contemplate. And so this is the space where all the different ideas come together and you can reflect on how you could apply some of these ideas, but maybe some of the other things you've encountered off, off your own kind of initiative um, back into your own cities and spaces and your own kind of privatized public spaces. And then finally, um, outside of the pavilion, there's the surprise seventh room that Maddie mentioned earlier, um, which is the public toilet. And the British Pavilion is one of the only pavilions that has um, a toilet, it has a series of toilets in its basement that nobody really knows about because they're not open to the public. But um, when we went to actually first measure up the pavilion, which was during the installation um, for the Art Biennale, we realized that there were toilets in the basement and, um, and it became a really big social hub because all the other pavilions wanted to use these toilets. And so we thought um, public toilets are such an important subject and they kind of determine how much of pub the public realm we can actually use. As we saw during the recent lockdowns when you know, the closure of public toilets meant that you couldn't really stray too far from your home. So we tried to open this up, which wasn't really possible because of a kind of Italian legislation and lots of red tape. Um, so instead we've put it on display to hopefully provoke a conversation as to why there is so much kind of, you know, infrastructure like public toilets that, or toilets that could easily become public that exist, but are kind of kept closed off for no reason. And so finally, I guess the, the big question that this provokes and kind of returning to the overall theme of the Biennale of how we all live together, um, I think the question we wanted to provoke in, in our pavilion was really why can't all public spaces be gardens of delight? So we hope we get to talk about that more with everyone here in the conversation to follow. Um, but, um, sorry, I, I suppose as well, just to say that um, obviously each of the installations have been designed as these really immersive kind of testing ground experiences. And we recently um, launched this 3D interactive tour so that anyone can go around and experience the pavilion, which will pop into the chat. Yeah, but um, I guess we can leave it there just because I guess we're running a bit behind, but um, we'll now hand over to uh, Juliana to tell us more about the Lithuanian Space Agency. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Julianas Urbanas, the founder of the Lithuanian Space Agency an extraterrestrial cultural organization that researches cosmic imagination and gravitational aesthetics. At the Venice Architecture Biennale, the agency as a Lithuanian pavilion is presenting its very first space program, which is based on idea to make a new and artificial planet of human bodies. And the pavilion, as, as Lithuanian Space Agency, located at uh, the Church of Maria de Dereleti, might be considered as, on a, as an ongoing rehearsal or an artistic and scientific feasibility study of what it would be like to make such a planet and what kind of ethical, aesthetic and political implications it would provoke. At the very core of a pavilion, uh, the Lithuanian Space Agen a Agency uh, temporary headquarters, there is a machine, uh, a, a 3D scanner structure that scans the visitors and sense the 3D models of the bodies of the visitors into simulated environment of outer space, or more specifically into one of the Lagrangian points, which is 
free of gravity, it's super cold, it's dark, it's vacuum. The bodies, the frozen bodies, find themselves floating, falling to each other, connecting and converging into a blob because of their uh, unique weak gravities that make them fall to each other. A new planet is being formed, making everybody as co-architects of such a an extraterrestrial bioarchitectural composition. In relation to the umbrella topic of uh, Biennale, uh, such a uh, thought experiment, uh, planet made of human bodies, might be considered as kind of astro symmetry or as a monument for humanity made from humanity or as a formation of a new form of living being in the scale of a planet, or as, as a settlement for new human species. Uh, think, for example, of a very original definition of cyborg, which refers to human who could survive the hostile environment of outer space without any life support, just naked. So what such individuals would do, how they would live, and what they would need if they were placed in such an uh, environment. Environment which might be seen as equivalent of the nothingness, the nothingness at its finest. Uh, on the other hand, the project might be uh, seen as an invitation to push architecture and the very term living to the extreme so that we could look at ourselves from the perspective of an alien. Uh, think of the project as a staged, uh, staged thought experiment. Uh, take a large population of humans, strip them of all the terrestrial labels, such as uh, social, gender, political constructs, and put them together in, in close proximity so that they could stay for a substantial amount of time. That would be the ultimate revision of human architecture. Thank you very much. And I invite Ewan Anderson. Thank you very much, Julianus. Let me just get my slides up and then I'll get going just a second. Full screen. Right. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm up last, so I'll, I'll try and be brief because it would be good to have some time to uh, discuss all these fantastic projects we'll be uh, looking at this evening. So. I'm going to talk about um, Scotland's contribution to uh, the Biennale, which actually isn't the Biennale, it's at the V&A Dundee. Um, and our response to the, the question, how will we live together, was really, in a sense, to take a very straightforward approach. And that was to actually get people talking to each other to discuss how they will live together and really to bring together um, architects and citizens in a very direct conversation to almost strip away the layers of uh, bureaucracy and administration which are involved in how places and buildings are, are realized today and really bring it back to a fundamental straightforward conversation uh, and we we work with 25 citizens and 25 architects and designers throughout Scotland and in, in five different places which represented very different contexts from one end of the the country to the other. And we challenged each of the citizens to come up with a wish, a wish for how their place could be in which they lived could be a better place. And we challenged the architects to come up with ideas that responded uh, to each of those wishes. And that the ideas were developed through very direct conversations between the citizens and the architects in, in each of the places. And it was framed in a, in a very simple way in terms of a wish, in a sense it's a, it's a, a timeless uh, sense of hope and positivity about the future. And 
we framed the response very much as something which wasn't particularly challenging, but it was saying, well, what if, what if we did this? How would this work? How would this respond to your wish? And both the, the, the question and response were very much framed around trying to encourage people just simply to talk to each other and open up about how it felt to live in the place they lived and for the architects to engage with them very directly with ideas for, for these places. So we went from one end of the country to the other in a series of one day workshops, which involved a lot of walking around the places. We walked as, as groups around the, the places. We started in Lerwick in, in Shetland and in the very northern um, tip of Scotland and the UK. We went down to Annan in the, in the southwest, which is a, a much more rural environment, to Elgin, uh, which is a major centre in the highlands of uh, Scotland, and also to more urban locations in, in Paisley, uh, just to the west of Glasgow, and also uh, Wester Hales, um, which is a rather disenfranchised uh, community on the, on the fringes of Edinburgh, well away from historic um, centre of the, the, the city. And like everybody else on, who's talking tonight, we were, thought we were heading to Venice in, in 2020. Um, we didn't get there. And uh, Scotland Venice team took a decision very early in um, early this year to change tack and um, to relocate the exhibition to the v and at Dundee, which was a I have to say a disappointment at the time because we were looking very much looking forward to going to Venice and, and, and joining everybody there. But in many respects, in, it felt like the right thing to do uh, because at this particular time when we spent, all of us have spent so much time apart having an exhibition which is much more accessible to the people we've been engaging with and who will arguably... Um, have much more resonance with the subjects in this exhibition, it felt like the right thing to do. Um, so the exhibition captures every, every wish and every idea on a, on a series of panels. And we focused uh, the artists and designers of coming up with one image which captured the essence of the idea in a very tangible way, which could com be communicated to a, a, a wide audience, but also in an inspiring and evocative way. And it wasn't about producing uh, polished drawings, it was about producing an image which captured the essence of, of the idea. So these are displayed in the exhibition, they're very accessible to the people who've been engaging with them. But we've also produced an, a series of five films uh, by the filmmaker Bash Art Creative, which really captured the engagement story, the conversation and the stories in each of the five places, but also try to capture the essence of the place in this uh, super widescreen format, which when you're sitting very close to it is very immersive because it fills your, your full field of, of vision. Uh, and this was actually designed for the space in Venice, but it's worked very successfully in, in BNA Dundee um, as well. And what has perhaps become the, the centerpiece of the exhibition is a space which we call the cloud of dreams and every every wish from all of the citizens in each of the places, plus uh, visitors to the exhibition are invited to leave and write on a card their wish for the future of the place in which they live. And these are all hung within the space to form this ever growing cloud of, of wishes and, and hopes for the future um, for everyone who's, who's, who's engaged with this. And the other uh, really positive thing about being in Dun, being able to put the exhibition on Dundee is it allowed the uh, engagement to continue. And there's been a, a series of um, conversations with five different communities within the city of Dundee. It's been focused around uh, plans for a, a new high school, which is really going to bring five different communities together, which haven't previously shared the same school. So it allowed the process to go on and actually it's, been very fitting in, in, in Dundee that the time when everybody's been living apart and so many rules and things we've been previously been told are impossible have actually happened. So it's perhaps never been a, a better time to ask the question, how will we live together? Because there's so many things that we people now feel more comfortable about challenging and saying, well, you know, the next step beyond what if is, is why not? Why can't we do this? And there's been 
some fantastic responses coming out from the citizens and D and also the designers who've been who've been working with them and, and very very challenging responses. Um, uh, Leone, the director of VNA, described the this initiative as as quiet radicalism, which I was very pleased to hear her say because in many senses it's it's challenging how places are produced, how places are created, how the planning system fits within that, and turning the whole whole thing around. And actually placing architects at the very center of this process and it's also trying to in many senses rediscover this the very central civic role of architects in the process and working very directly with the people who 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 live in and live their lives in these places so um i'll leave you with this image which is actually these um these are two primary school children who were involved in the engagement in dundee came up with fantastic ideas for their own own community. And, and I, I really enjoy this image because there's a tremendous sense of optimism about it. And as we all come out of this horrible period we've all been through, now's the time perhaps to look to the future and think very optimistically and really grab hold of the, the question of how will we live together in the future. So um, that's all from me. I'm now going to open it up to uh, bring everybody back and um, Take questions and, and discuss what everything we've been we've seen this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. I think we've got everyone back in. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm just completely blown away by all the ideas and um, excitement, research, and thought that have gone into um, these five different proposals. It's the first time in a long time I also haven't been able to go to Venice, so it's really great to kind of get these little snapshot insights um, into such a wide variety of schemes. Now, we are overrunning um, a little bit, but I'd like to um, take some time to just explore some of the ideas um, that have been discussed. There is a Q&A function um, on this event, so um, please do put your questions in and um, we will try. Uh, to get to some of them. I, I just wanted to start um, really by sort of pulling out two themes that I think have come out um, today in, in various talks. Um, one is around the ideas of ownership, um, but the other which I wanted to sort of start on is something that I saw um, much more in perhaps the Irish contribution from Fiona and Claire, um, and also Stella and, and, and Cabergé, is this um, sort of idea of the artifact and um, sort of rarefying the artifact. Um, I wondered, Fiona and Claire, if you wanted to respond um, initially, it feels like the data centers and the data itself has almost been seen as a religious object um, within the pavilion. Is, is, is that fair? And um, I think in a way, if anything, we kind of wanted to invert that. So, um, you know, through the process of scorching it and kind of undoing it. And I'm not sure if you, um, the video probably gives you a better idea of the actual, um, you know, materiality of the pavilion itself. But it's, you know, it's, it's quite uh, loud and rambunctious and messy. You know, it's got this kind of dressing table and everything scorched and it smells and um, so I think we really wanted to undo this idea of this sublime data center being this pristine um, entity you know so if anything we're trying to turn that aspect on its head if, if you understand uh, mm. and, and the, Claire I don't know if you yeah no that's um, really interesting that you picked up on that um, I guess the the kind of data porn that you see on Google is, you know, these <coughs> beautiful, pristine, minimalist machine aesthetic spaces, you know, these interior images that I'm talking about that you find at the data center in particular, excuse me. <coughs> um, and, and that we kind of felt was the kind of corporate propaganda image um, which we're all very seduced by aesthetically, I have to say. The lighting conditions are so amazing. Um, so the burning and the singeing and the notion of the bonfire too as a kind of 
artifact that crosses over a kind of community event, but it's also kind of dystopian. Like if you think the bonfire is a kind of pagan event that mm -hmm. was kind of had some sinister connotations culturally. Um, so, um, yeah, I really appreciate the question. And it's something that we worked very hard to kind of um, make sure we, we, we thread the line well between um, you know, presenting it as a cultural space that we all familiar with and what that image is, as well as trying to be critical um, of that representation. Mm. Mm. It's really interesting what you said about the fire as well, as I was sort of writing notes as you were talking earlier, I wrote Pagan three times down in response to the, <laughs> the fire. So that's really, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Stella and, and Kevrije, uh, the um, your sort of placing of these rocks um, as artifacts, as, as objects, I thought that was quite interesting as well. It sort of takes a, a, a cave, which is sort of shelter and shielding, and transforms them into these kind of, again, rarefied artifacts, perhaps, or sort of jewel-like um, entities, but I suppose that also have a slightly threatening edge and that they might be coming down. I think you sort of talked about them as rain. I, I wonder uh, if you could talk a little more about that. Maybe I'll start. Uh, thanks for the question, because I think it really hits the heart of our project in, in two ways, in a way, because um, the subjects of artifacts being returned and more so stolen artifacts from museums uh, being returned to Africa and generally global South countries. Quite an important and topical theme for us and um, how conflicting it is for institutions to look at that colonial history and, and, and yet look at what it's looking ahead, you know, at least from the African perspective. Do we just receive these artifacts? And it's like, oh, great. It hasn't been with our communities for uh, a few hundred years not too sure what to do with it. So it's part of that. And what, what does it mean to generate and create new artifacts and meaning based on our histories? Uh, a difficult history, but trying to almost beautify the output of, of our reflection of that history. So I, I, I think uh, maybe Stella might add on it, but to conclude for me, it, it, it really hits home into, into how, we, how we reflect on our past and present and project a view into the future um, with regards to new generations and, and, and how you own your history and celebrate it, but yet not get bogged down so much by, by that sort of weight, but try to be liberated by creating artifacts that represent mm -hmm. the past. Yeah. And I guess also, um how we transpose this by caves, which were caves that were used by the Mau Mau to, you know, um, plan how to go around the whole colonial um, imprisonment and taking away of their freedom. And then going with the theme of the, of the Biennale, how we really live together, we are able to sit, um, you know, figuratively under the same cave, but this time talk about what is the way forward? You know, this has happened. It happened before these injustices were done, but it, they were done and here we are now, how do we move forward um, together? So it's interesting how, you know, this cave about hundred years ago, how it was used and how it's been transported to be used differently to possibly discuss um, what was done, come to an agreement, yes, it was done, let's reconcile and move forward into the future and forget about um, what has happened because it's happened. Um, yeah, so it's just um, replying to that whole question, how, how will we live together? Thank you. Uh, there's so much I can pick up on, on what um, everyone said, but I'm mindful of the clock. So just to kind of move on to this idea of ownership and, and maybe starting um, Madeline and, and Manager, 
Um, you talk a lot about sort of the barriers to access and who owns the space, whether that's the data space or the physical space. Um, and I wondered where you sort of thought delight might come into that ownership. Um, I think we, like delight is a really important word for us and obviously inspired by the Bosch painting, which has so much amazing, I mean, you can see a bit of it behind me, but it has so much amazing delight in, in the activities all the people occupying it are doing, but also in the fantastical kind of architectural forms. And um, I think in removing barriers, it was really about how people can occupy their privatized public spaces in unique and surprising ways. And one thing we really wanted to do with our exhibition is not necessarily like be too didactic or dictate how people should occupy these spaces. And that's why our the text in the exhibition is limited to that single question per room, because we really wanted to, to use the exhibition as a testing ground and to learn from how people um, you know, kind of inhabited these spaces and kind of use some of the things that we put there in, in ways we never imagined. And hopefully from that, we can take away some lessons to apply to kind of live projects and public spaces back in the UK. I suppose something we were really mindful of is that this is like a very sort of serious topic that's often discussed in quite a dry way. Um, and we wanted to make this a really inclusive conversation, bringing lots of different people around the table. And I think one way for us was to kind of do that in quite a sort of joyful way, I suppose, um, and bring delight in kind of the physical aspects of the exhibition and taking the forms and the colours from the Bosch painting. Um, and the painting really did become a like tool for us um, in both developing the exhibition concept, but also discussing in the project with people um, and I suppose as well just in terms of the types of spaces that we would love to see more of in our city it is those spaces that kind of spark uh, sparks joy and, and bit pieces of delight within you and um, sort of those everyday spaces how can we make them much more welcoming and accessible so that everyone feels like they belong there. Thank you and Julianus um, I kind of feel like you're, there's, there's themes of ownership um, in your piece as well, sort of who owns the body and what's it's gone into space, but also who owns the space and then the ownership of the, the, the planet that um, is then created. I wonder what sort of thoughts on ownership um, you were looking to explore. Um, uh, actually, it is more about not it's more about posing questions rather than answering <laughs> it, it it is really open to the public to decide whether it has uh, it is challenging a very very original uh, etymological original idea of ownership or or not it's 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 very open on the other hand you may actually say that it is challenging uh the the current understanding of ownership. But of, all of a sudden, there is no longer such a term, ownership. The, everything that we possess in whatever way, all of a sudden becomes public, ultimately public, uh, even the body of yours. That would be quite a radical thought experiment, but just try to do this kind of Fox thought experiment and you'll see that it's quite, it, it would, you would get at the very, very foundation of uh, the current times we live in. Yeah, but uh, what happens actually within this stage thought experiment is when people come and they scan themselves, there is something that, uh, this is some kind of unique kind of contemplating process that is not verbal, it's even not maybe based on thought, which is something that happens with uh, choreographical and bodily imagination. Usually people who are into really uh, rigorous thinking mode, they come and seriously scan themselves. Okay, what's, what shall I do next? And then when they see themselves floating naked, <laughs> naked in outer space, they come back, no, I don't want to do that. And they come back, do another move. And they come back the third, fourth, and fifth time until they get loose. <laughs> they roll on the ground. But something, some kind of unique kind of bodily thinking happens in there. And uh, what is really beautiful after a while, they bring other bodies 
to themselves, uh, relatives, dogs, even plants. So there is no longer one singular body, but, but bodies and conglomerates, <laughs> assemb as assemblages of bodies. So it's a little hard to, do, to, to tell what, uh, what is uh, an individual and what belongs to that individual and what actually makes an individual an individual. Is it just a body or, or, or anything else? Yeah. Yeah, but probably it's, uh, I, I would try to uh, also answer from very different kind of uh, perspective, which has little to do maybe with the term ownership, but rather with a very uh, uh, question that is forming the umbrella topic of the Biennale. It actually asks how we will live. Keep, uh, note, the, note the emphasis on will. It, it, is, it has actually has certain... Uh, uh, ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, phalanchentristic power in the question <laughs> that it it says that how we will live, but not how we could uh, how we could live, but how we will live. So all of us are taking this uh, power and saying this is how we are going to live. I think if this kind of question is a bit too naive and uh, a bit narrow-minded, so I would rather edit it and add how we could live and open up to a wider speculative potential so that we could think of of plural way in a plural way how pos what kind of possible you know parallel uh, uh, realities and, and and futures we can come up with so that's mm -hmm. why our pavilion is not telling anything it's it might be terrible it might be horrible but it might be also super utopian <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a really good um, juxtaposition into kind of you and, and uh, the, um, the, your project in Scotland, that kind of collective, like we will or we could live together. Yeah, I was just sitting here wondering how, how on earth I was going to follow you. That you <laughs> I, I, I really uh, was very interested in the, in the final point about how, how could we? And I wish I'd thought of that. And actually, that was a question. We, we considered because our, a lot of our project was about was actually just architects asking questions and just engaging and, and doing an awful lot of listening. So rather than imposing the arguably the traditional will of the of the architect and designer, it was it was more about conversations and how could this be, you know, and that's in a way it's uh, at the very essence of the whole what if what if question which we were seeking to. To explore in a way, just re perhaps reposition architects in this very central role in the whole process. And architects feel it feels like architects have been marginalized more and more in the process of how places are created and 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 delivered. And I think that there's in in the aftermath of the pandemic, pandemic and the aftermath of you know, the tragedy at Grenfell and a range of other things, arguably, there's an opportunity to do, do more and recapture the central ground and actually do more good with it and shift away from this progression of being marginalised more and more in, the, in, in recent years. But um, I'll, uh, I'll go back to thanking uh, Julianus for his, his, his shift in the, in the question. The could, the could is really important, I think. Thank you. I'd really love to go around and um, ask everyone about the kid, but I think um, our host is going to come in and tell us that we're already overrunning. Um, we um, are. Out of time. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole. We are indeed already overrunning. Um, so unfortunately, I think that has to be our last um, point of discussion. Uh, we have had loads of people tuning in from across the world tonight. We've had people from Germany. We've had people from London. We've had people from Ireland. We've had people from Aberdeen. It's been really wonderful to have everyone on board i'm not sure why i've switched to webinar host but never mind um thank you so much to our wonderful panel and our wonderful chair tamsi um thank you all for coming along uh you're welcome to just turn your videos and audios off or kind of wave and say thank you at the end and then i'm just gonna wrap us up so if you all just want to kind of say thank you thanks everyone thank you thank you thanks